Hello and welcome to One North Maine, Brockton's magazine show where we profile people, places and events that make this city, our city great. You might hear a little hush in my tone today because we're at the Brockton Public Library. The library was host to a fantastic series, the Immigration Series. Some of you know it as We Are All Americans Now. We at BCA in One North Maine covered six of these fantastic events. We had great speakers, good lectures, an interesting discussion on a variety of topics. One thing is for sure, we are different, but the similarities that we all have in our fair city far outweigh those differences. So I want you to enjoy this special edition. Sit back, relax, grab a book if you want to before starting the show, but see what your community, the City of Champions, has to offer. <laughs> The Immigration Series kicked off in 2017 and carried all the way into June of 2018. The first Immigration Series event we covered was back in October of 2017 and it involved a doctor who, new to the country, worked his way up and had a successful life coming over to America. It was an interesting start to the series. Let's take a look. The American Dialogue Series is made up of five different parts. First, lectures. Second, forums. Third, interview training work workshops and then interviews of immigrants past and present. Fourth, we will create a new segment in our adult services department. The recorded interviews will be placed on digital files. And last, each year we will publish some of the interviews in anthologies. So this series is both important and unique. It is important because, our, because of its existence is owed to, its immig to immigration being a hot button issue on our local and national news. This project is unique because the purpose of this project is to bring two immigrant experiences in conversation and in history together since they've been separated so far in this immigration debate. The older Ellis Island European immigrant groups with the newer African, Asian, Latin American, and Caribbean immigrant groups. Nobody is trying to bring these different groups together except the American Dialogue Series. So thank you for coming out tonight and for supporting us. And we continue, and we hope you continue to come. Thank you. This is America, and all of us in this country should be grateful. But I think through what we stand for and what those places can do for all of us, I think it bring all of us together. And of course, I mean, some of you from Cape Verde, because I was talking to some of you earlier, some of you from Haiti, and some of you were born in this country. But together, I think, because of this place, we come here to listen to someone like Pastor Polikov, who is about to tell you guys, you know, more about immigration and stuff like that. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come in. And could you please put your hands together for Pastor Polikov? I want to enlighten you. I want to reflect. And I want both of us to examine and to end with what all immigrants start with, hope. Hope is one sentiment that all immigrants cherish. And tonight, I will take you on my journey by giving you a number of personal scenarios of my life in this country. And for me, that life begins as an immigrant, but end as a citizen. As you already know, my name is Joseph Polikep. <laughs> Scene one, the bus ride from hell. Ah, a bus ride. We can see some of the city. My sister and I were reasonably happy that morning. We got on the bus and saw people sitting and standing. But we quickly became the scene 
a pleasant looking broad woman sitting with a nice looking young man, they can't keep their eyes off of me and my sister as if they were in a daze. I thought to myself, well, I wonder if my sister is thinking what I am thinking. Because they look for us. It was not a good look. But I tried to keep my smile shining. We were finally in our freedom seats as I insisted upon calling them. Yet increasingly nervous about what was coming, even with my head bowed, my sister gently tapped me on the shoulder to look up. And right there, the drama started. They suddenly saw us for the first time. The people sitting on the left side of the bus next to my sister jumped up out of their seat and stood at a distance from us now. They in turn signaled to the people in front of us to leave their seats, and they did. Then a person pulled out a pen to write his masterpiece on us. But before he did, he shouted, these immigrants have come from Haiti. Maybe they have AIDS. It was not too long before the bus was completely emptied. A Haitian brother cried, oh God, what is wrong with us? The four Haitians that were left on the nearly empty bus look at each other. It was shameful and embarrassing. Sin two, the difference is in you. I can't believe he speaks English like us. Yeah. We're focused on us. Always make bigotry remarks. Remarks that was whispered, but with just the right amount of volume so I could hear them. I listened to them. I used to be so frustrated sometimes. After gymnastic one day, I prayed hard that they would say nothing. As my child went towards me with excitement, he hugged me. As that, at that moment, he then said something to me. Thank you. One of the parents that had insisted upon sitting next to me said, I can't believe it. How did he learn English? He speak it like us. He learned it the same way your kids learned it, I responded. Two things became revelations to me that day. The absurdity of the parents and how I was becoming as American in my growing English as my two years old son. Scene three. A day that will live in infamy. Let me share with you the story. I was young and curious when I was in college. Anxious for knowledge and possessing growing confidence in myself and in my new country. I had vowed to myself that if I encountered something that made me furious, I would stand up against it. Well, what about this scene? That morning I had heard there was a blood drive. I went out and encouraged my friends to give blood. I was relieved when I was able to get five of them to go with me. Upon arrival, the Red Cross nurse looked at me. Where are you from? She asked. I said, I'm from Haiti. I am sorry, she said. We do not take blood from Haitians and Africans. I could not move my body away from that line. I was not resistance or a, a, a defiant stand. No, it was as if I was in chains and was motionless, motionless trapped in time and space. She, of course, politely repeated herself as she was, given out false knowledge but comfort food to the fees that were being hassled at the time. The aid virus it generated in Haiti and Africa. I said, what do you mean? I am now in America. I looked at my friends and I put my head down with, a, with impressive humiliation. Don't give up on yourselves 
urge and dreams so quickly. You guys are young. This is the right place for you. Embrace it and, and your new adventure. Haiti is a land of, un, of uncertainty. Why do you want to go back there? We told her, Miss Pat, we don't like the cold. We don't speak the language. We are not comfortable. She said, you guys will eventually speak English. You will get adjusted. This is the best country on earth. People come from everywhere to be citizens in America. We love people. We respect people. And our legal system here is fair. We share with people. One day you guys will vote just like we do. I know that is, that is a problem in Haiti. I hope you don't go. Eventually, you will have your own car. You will have your own home. You will have ready access to college. You can say whatever you want as long as you are not threatening to hurt others. You are free here. Please don't go. She hugged each one of us and we, we said to her goodbye. Neither Miss Pat nor us knew our next step. Now, because Miss Pat was eloquent and sincere about our staying, the hug she gave us at the end of our conversation saved us. In the end, we decided that we wanted to stay. The hope that one day we would be American citizens. Next up in the series was Dr. Barbara Lewis. She had some interesting insight on what it means to be an immigrant in our fair city, how she was received, and what she did with the resources that were available. Check it out. There are many adjectives I could use to describe this wonderful woman. Brilliant, gifted, created, creative, intelligent, just to name a few. Dr. Lewis is a professional scholar of history, theater, literature, and social sciences. She earned her doctorate in theater at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She has taught at City College, Lehman, and New York University. This evening, Dr. Lewis will be leading a discussion and presenting a PowerPoint on the American Dream price tag, the Royals, Massachusetts First Immigrant Dynasty. It is part of the American Immigration Dialogue series being presented by the Brockton Public Library under the title, We Are All Americans Now. One of the reasons why I was sent to high school in Montreal was because of segregation. Um, my mother uh, felt that segregation was not the proper environment uh, for me to learn in. And so um, she was a teacher. Uh, she was not a wealthy teacher, but she saved her money and she researched and found a school in a town in Quebec called Granby. I will turn around and look at the PowerPoint and start talking to you about <laughs> the PowerPoint that um, I've prepared for today, which uh, goes back to, um, it actually goes back to the 1600s. Um, and it moves from the 1600s into the 1700s, 1800s. Um, I'm trying to think if we hit the 1900s. We might not, but we certainly get back to this century. Okay, so um, the, um, the family in question are the royals. They didn't start out as the royals. Um, the first one to come over here was William Ryle, um, but he was terribly, terribly ambitious as so many immigrant folks are. Um, the, the, the story is that the, the ones who tend to emigrate are the ones who have the ambition, the industry, and the drive. So he certainly had all of those. Um, and to express, at least this is my interpretation, to express that drive, he took the name Ryle that didn't have an O, and he added an O and made it royal. These are uh, the daughters, not of William Ryle or William Royal, but the daughters of 
Isaac Royal Jr. Isaac Royal Jr. was the grandson of William Ryle, who was the first one to come in 1629. Um, I chose this because for me it expresses aristocracy. Um, the, the young girls are dressed in, um, I'm going to assume it's satin, I'm not absolutely sure, but it, they're beautiful dresses. Um, and some of the emblems that are around them are emblems of traditional painting, um, the aristocracy in English um, history. Um, they are both, um, they both get married. Um, they marry well. They marry into wealth. The um, tradition among the um, immigrant class of that echelon tended to be that they conserved uh, the money and added to it. Um, sometimes that meant they didn't marry for love, but for property. But that was the way it was. Um, and um, these um, young girls uh, grow up. Uh, one of them actually dies a bit early um, after childbirth, but one of them escapes with her father in 1773 when um, the American Revolution is threatening. Uh, so when uh, William Ryle landed, he had no family of note and few connections. What he had was youth and determination, the strength of his body. He also came as a contract worker, so he had a job. And his job was to cut down the trees. Um, at the time, um, the, the, it was largely forest, and to clear and create settlements, the forest had to be cut down, and so that was his initial job. Um, he was very different, though, in terms of his ambition. Um, his ambition allowed him to climb higher than some other folks were able to do. He seated a dynasty um, which yielded Mary and Elizabeth Royal. Here I was connecting the um, painting that we had seen previously, which was done by John Singleton Copley, um, and Copley is the artist after whom uh, Copley Square is named, and also the Copley Library in uh, Boston. One of the things uh, I have to say that I particularly like, the guy off in the right with the jug, <laughs> um, he decided to take a, a bit of a rest from, from his um, hard work. Um, but I also note, or at least I believe that uh, the men were not the only ones working. There were also women working. The, the labor at that time was shared. Um, but there was so much labor to do, and maybe I'm uh, soft peddling things a little bit. There was so much pe uh, work to do that um, it was realized that all the work could not be completed by the folks who had come over on ships like the Arabella. European immigrants came. They came for the purpose of, at least the express purpose, of um, pursuing their religion. Um, but that was not an option that was accorded to the people who were here. They did not have the option of pursuing their religion. They were instead perceived as devils, as um, heathens. And um, that was, to a great extent, um, the incentive for war against them in the 1630s. Um, so I talk about this here. At first, William Ryle had no money for luxuries. His starter home was basic, a wigwam, which offered minor basic protection against cold and rain, even in the 1600s and I'm trying to be relevant to now. Even in the 1600s, getting a decent place to live was no small task. But he knew he had to pull himself up from the bottom, and um, he was a convert to the gospel of hard work. But also, when you work hard, that's sometimes not enough. You have to find ways to distinguish yourself, how to get away from the pack, how to pull away from the crowd. Um, and his focus on land was one way that he did that. Um, here I'm talking about um, kind of the similarity of life uh, that existed in places like, like Salem. 
um, and you see that they were able, this is probably an image from the, from the 19th century and certainly not from the 17th century, but through all of that industry um, working together, there was this ability to build up um, a civilization, to build up um, architectural wonders, to create roads and to demonstrate a, a civilization that was definitely on the move. Okay, I talked a bit about Harvard, uh, so um, that um, he supported the American Revolution, but you know his business dealings were such that his um, loyalties were on the side of the loyalists, um, and so he has to leave. He has to leave his property. He loved that uh, mansion uh, by the Mystic River, um, but he never got back there. It was his home. It was his desire to come back. Um, but he did not return. Veritas, which is truth in Latin, is the motto of Harvard Law School. And I wonder where is the truth? Where is the truth hiding? Um, in the question of what was the price of freedom? How much did it cost? Who had to pay? Who benefited? Who got, it, who got the most profit? Who got the most return? What do we do with all of that now? Because that is the question. That is the question that's facing us today. Thank you. Hmm, the city. Our city's Brockton. One of Brockton's new faces is Tina Cardoso. She ran for War Three City Councilor. Although she came up short, she sent a message that she wasn't going anywhere. She was going to remain involved in her community, and boy, has she. She was part of the immigration series. She had an interesting lecture. A successful mother who is also successful in her career. She's done it all. She's raised some great kids. You know what? Let's let Tina take it away. Tina? If you will, please. It's a privilege and an honor to be here with all of you and to introduce my sister friend, um, La Poderaza, which for those of you who don't know, Keverin Criolo, Poderaza refers to a woman of means, a woman who's powerful, and I think that that title is fitting for Miss Tina Cardoso. Tina's a trailblazer. She's the first Cape Verdean woman to run for public office here in the city of Brockton. She's a registered nurse who holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from UMass Boston, where she graduated in, in 1998. She's a proud um, family um, matriarch. She has three children, uh, Serena, who I see in the back, who's 29. Uh, Leah, 27, Nadia, 19, and she's the proud grandmother of Ethan, age 7. They all live in Brockton. Um, she lives with her significant other, her children, grandchild, and her puppy, Toby, um, which speaks to just how down-to-earth Tina is, and you'll get to see that in her speaking. She also is um, a primary care staff nurse at Boston Medical Center and Greater Roslindale Health Center. And she's the president and founder of Criales Unidas Incorporated, a nonprofit organization with the mission of encouraging and empowering women to give back to their community through networking, mentorship, and community outreach. The programs focus on educating our communities on important issues such as mental health, depression and suicide, domestic and youth violence pre prevention. In addition, Tina is the co-chair of Rockton's Promise Healthy Start Team. And as you may know, she was a candidate for Ward 3 City Councilor in this recent, um, the past election. Let's give a warm welcome to Tina Cardoso. So they're Cape Verdean, so it's not fear, but. <laughs> but. But there are nine inhabited islands. We have one island that's not inhabited. No? So people in the States refer to Cabo Verde as Cape Verde. Um, and that's what I grew up hearing was Cape Verde. But in 2013, the government there decided that they were no longer going to translate 
the island's name to Cape Verde. So since 2013, it's been referred to as the Republico of Cabo Verde. Okay, so just some fun facts. If anybody else has anything else, um, feel free to, to jump in. Like I said, these are things that even though, you know, we are Cape Verdean, a lot of this stuff, especially for folks that came really early on, I was four years old when I came, and my children, you know, there are a lot of things that they need to still learn about our country. And this is such a great effort, I gotta tell you, Melise, because we live in a very diverse city here in Brockton. So we really need to learn more about each other's cultures, you know, so that we're more tolerant of certain cultural um, aspects, you know, of our culture. So um, Brockton houses the most Cape Verdeans in the U.S. period, okay? So um, it's important that we learn about the culture. We learn from each other. So it's kind of hard to see, but in this first picture, this first scene is called Leaving the Motherland. In this first scene, earlier this year when I went to Cabo Verde, I'm from the island of San Vicente, I asked my mother a bit of our history. And I took these pictures, all of these pictures represent where we were born, my siblings and I. So, can I walk in? Yeah, right here in this, this is where I was born, my brother and I. My mother built a little house there. That land is still there. And, and she had six children and raised them in that little hole in the wall right there. When I asked my mom her story, Cape Verdeans have a hard time sharing their stories. So they kind of try to, you know, tell you as best they can without sharing too much. But basically, the story was that her, her grandfather was very abusive towards her and her mother. So my mom was physically abused for, for a long time by her grandfather, and once she was old enough to escape, she left uh, Sintantown, and she went to live with um, her godparent, her godmother, and, and her godfather. And in not so many words, she shared how, uh, because of the sexual advances of her godfather, she had to leave that home, um, and then went to Sintantown, I mean to San Vicente. So my mom goes to San Vicente, and there, she had two children by a man, once again, her words, um, the man was, I don't even know how to say this because I don't want to really like say the word, but she was forced into a relationship with this man and had two children, my, my older siblings. So she went through a lot with him, more abuse, um, which is not uncommon in our country. Women suffer a lot. They're the main caretakers of the children, and they go through a lot. There's a lot of domestic violence and sexual assault. My father is from the island Fogu. My father moved to San Vicente um, to be in the service. My mother washed clothes for service, servicemen. She never went to school. She never learned to read and write. So she did manual labor, basically. And she met my dad um, and was finally a, able to break free from the first relationship, met my dad, had four more children, and that's us here. When we came to America, I was a month shy from my fifth birthday here. And so my father came over first because his uh, brother and mother and father were here, they brought him over, and then brought us over, and my two older siblings who weren't his kids had to stay behind. So we came to the U.S., and we settled in Dorchester. You can move on to the slide. Welcome to the USA. We lived right in this area, Columbia Road, Savin Hill Lake area, uh, 1979, February of 1979. And during that time, you know, it was still very segregated. So there was a lot of racial tension in Dorchester, Savin Hill, South Boston. Um, and you really couldn't go into South Boston as a black person. Um, or even Savin Hill, because there was just a lot of rach racial tension even then. There were a lot of fights um, amongst the different groups. There were a lot of turf wars. So it was really rough growing up in, in Dorchester. They worked really hard, you know, back then. It made very little money. And we had, you know, they had the four kids and then sent for the other two older siblings. So there was six of us and the two of them working to feed us all. So it was tough growing up. Oh. 
Who wants to the next slide? So, who's watching the kids? We stayed home alone a lot back then. And, that, and this goes for everyone. It's not just Cape Verdeans. Or, this is just how it was. We were called latchkey kids. Did everybody remember that term? And um, it was to the point where we were basically raising ourselves at times because our parents had to work really hard to take care of us, especially as, as immigrants and especially as folks who didn't really have that much education. And so who's watching the kids? They actually called DSS on us when we were little because of this. Um, so then we had to have them send over someone to watch us. So we had actually a nun from the church that would come by to watch us after school. So if you can imagine how tough that was. So February 19, 2017, we celebrated 40 years of citizenship. We are all Americans now. Um, and thanks to my mom and her efforts that she was able to get her citizenship and then make all of us citizens. So we were very happy. So this, she, this past year, we went out and celebrated 40 years of American citizenship. And we're very glad and fortunate that our mom and dad, even though with all the adversities and everything that we went through, were able to bring us here to this country and afforded us the opportunities that we have today. So then my story begins. I was very, like I said, I was never really a kid. So at 16, I left home. And I was always smart. I went to Boston Latin School. Um, but like I said, at 16, I felt like I was a woman. I had, like, I had done so much in such a short time. And I got in with the wrong crowd um, and started dating boys, stay away from the boys, right? And ended up getting pregnant. So I had to drop out of Latin. Um, and by the time I was 18, I, already, I had two kids by a man that was 10 years older than me. And now we fast forward to now um, with everything that I went through as a teenage mom um, and all my experiences, I wanted to share. I wanted to be able to give back to the community and help others you know, who are in similar situations. So a year ago, a little over a year, a year and a half now, Michelle, my cousin in the back, we thought about doing a women's group where we would get together as women and support each other through whatever we were going through and encourage each other, empower each other to, you know, do whatever it is that we needed to do, whether it be get a driver's license or, you know, go to school, continue education, whatever it is that we wanted to do. So I started this organization called Criolas Unidas, which is K Verdean Women United. It became something bigger. It's still growing. Um, and what we are focusing on now is the mental health of the Cape Verdean community for the most part now because in our culture there's a lot of stigma around mental illness. At the time I started this, we had lost a couple people here in Brockton to um, murder-suicides. So that was on our mind and we have a lot of issues with youth violence, gun violence, so that was on our mind. So we sat around and we said, what can we do to help out and give back? And we came up with Criolas Unidas doing the work in the community to help folks understand and help our people, you know, connect them with resources and that type of thing. And we've been going strong for almost two years. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization now. We just got our first grant recently, um, and we're starting to do parenting workshops. Um, helping parents to identify risk factors in their youth, looking at childhood trauma, how it shapes us um, as adults, how it impacts our lives, helping to start the conversations so that we can try to identify solutions. So I'm very proud of Criolas Unidas and all that we've done in the community. So I ran um, against an incumbent of 14 years, so that was really, really hard. Um, and I came very close. So. If nothing else, I wanted to encourage and empower, especially women, especially minority women, to be more involved in local elections and to be more involved in the community. That's what the next years of my life I'm going to dedicate to, is just showing people the importance of sharing your experiences so that you can help others. And I hope that I accomplished a little bit of that with the campaign, and I hope to continue that work with you. 
This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Remember that to love America is to love all Americans, because love has no labels. Hmm. Always interesting reading at the Brockton Public Library. Who is Brockton's most famous citizen? Most of you probably responded out loud, Rocky Marciano, and you know what? You're probably right. In April of 2018, former city councilor Todd Petty spoke about Rocky's life, his real name, and the roots he laid in Brockton. Let's check it out. And on behalf of the wonderful staff of the Brockton Public Library, I would like to personally welcome you to the Brockton Public Library. We have a, I'm just gonna kind of focus on the, uh, the, boss, the boxing aspect of this a little bit. The, uh, and Todd, Todd's dad um, grew up with Rocky, so we can get some more personal um, input from Todd on, uh, on Rocky and his family than I can, uh, than I can tell you. Um, I mean, we all know Rocky was the heavyweight champion of the world, undisputed, only, first and only undefeated champion. He knocked out Jersey Joe Walcott on September 23rd. Let's see if I got that right. September 23rd, 1952. Rock Marciano, the son of Italian immigrants. On September 23rd, 2012, the tallest statue of an athlete was unveiled right here in Brockton, Massachusetts. The 22 foot, six inch statue was commissioned to be built by the late World Boxing Council President Jose Suleiman. Jose Suleiman was a native of Fall River and he wanted to honor and recognize the greatest heavyweight champion of them all, Brockton's own Rocky Marciano. But what led to the dedication of that statue? Let's go back 60 years from that dedication date. September 23rd, 1952. Rocky Marciano's record at that time, 42 wins, zero losses, and 37 of those wins, Tony, 37 of those 42 wins by knockout. Rocky came in at 184 and Jersey Joe at 198. He was also taller than Rocky too. Rocky was a slight favorite going into that fight. But when it began, Jersey Joe gave Rocky all he could handle. The scheduled 15 round fight was about to begin. <laughs> the champ and Rocky moved around. Jersey Joe was a little smoother than Rocky. He was light on his feet. Rocky was more brute, wanted to get in and mix it up and start punching right away. Then, at one minute and three seconds of the first round, the unthinkable happened. Jersey Joe hit Rocky with a left. And for the first time in his career, Rocky was floored. The round ended. The men came out. They came out for rounds two, three, four. Imagine, if you will, the pounding that they've given one another round after round. Round five, round six, round seven. Jersey Joe Walcott was hitting Rocky with everything that he had. But Rocky kept fighting back. Rounds eight, rounds nine, Rounds 10, rounds 11, they kept fighting one another. Neither one would give up. Rocky and Jersey Joe are starting to show signs of the 12 rounds of relentless punching on one, each, on one another. Both men swollen in the face came out for the 13th round. But Jersey Joe Walcott would be trying to do 
what 42 men before him were unable to do. You know what that was? Stop Rocky Marciano. The two gladiators came out for the 13th round. Jersey Joe was moving to the side a little bit. And he started backing up what looked like preparation to throw a right at Rocky. Joe's left was down and Rocky saw this very thin margin of light. And then boom, like a piston. That picture right there changed everything. Jersey Joe started to crumble. Rocky hit him with an insurance punch to the back of the head, and that was it. Jersey Joe was out for the count. The referee instructed Rocky to go to a neutral corner. The fight was over. Rocky's the new heavyweight champion of the world, and his Brockton trainer, Ali Colombo, ran into the ring, and he was the first person to touch Rocky Marciano as Rocky was the new champion. What led Rock Marciano on the journey that brought him the championship on that great day in 1952? Well, we're going to tell you about it. Pierino Marciano was born on April 18, 1894, in Ripetiatina, Italy, a small town in the Abruzzi region of Italy, towards the Adriatic Sea, if you look over from Rome. His father's name was Rocco. Pierino came to America in 1915 at the request of some friends of his by the name of Campanelli that lived in Braintree. So Rocco came over here and did, did some construction work for a while, little while before he joined the United States Marine Corps in 1917. After he joined the Marines, he was sent to France to fight in World War I. And while he was in France, he was injured by shrapnel that he carried in his body for the rest of his life, in his legs, in his midsection, all over his body. And also, he was a victim of a mustard gas attack that was used in World War I. And for the rest of, the rest of his life, when he came back from the war, he always had that taste in his mouth, the mustard gas. And he, those of us who knew him, always remember that he had a piece of hard candy in his mouth at all times. And his uh, daughter Betty told me the other day that uh, he preferred butterscotch. Whenever he had an opportunity to have butterscotch, he'd, he'd have a butterscotch uh, lozenge in his mouth. Porter said to Mr. Marciano, Mr. Marciano, he said, Pierino, he said, what is the most proudest moment of your life? What is it that you're most proud of? Now, me, I think that you would probably say, gee, that punch wasn't so bad right there. Or beating uh, Roland Nastasa when he was 37 and 0. That's not, that's not too bad either. I have six children. Each one of those moments is proud. But you know what he told the reporter? He said, the day I got discharged from the Marine Corps, the colonel came up to me and he said, Private First Class Marcajano, you can be proud to call yourself an American. But back in those days, when an immigrant served in the military, upon discharge, you got American, you got automatic US citizenship. Can you imagine that? Of all the things that happened throughout his life, his son becoming champion, father of six children. Successful man, you know, working a humble life and here in Ward 2 and becoming an American citizen. It ties in beautifully with what this whole series is all about. Pierino died many years later from emphysema, which was directly linked to his exposure to the mustard gas in World War I. Now, Rocky's mother, Pasqualina Picciuto, was born on January 6, 1901, in San Bartolomeo, Italy. 
right here. This is where she's from, right here. And this is, as I said earlier, this is just south of Ripetiatina. Now, the two did not know one another in, when they were in Italy. The Picciotos arrived in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1917 when Pasquino was just 16 years old. Then tragedy struck the family. Pasquino had a brother named Nicholas who was riding his bike one day. He was hit by a truck and killed. Very, very sad day for their family. And Pasquino gave Peter, her son, when he was born, she gave him Nicholas's name for his middle name in memory, to, in memory of him. So Peter Nicholas Marciano, his middle name is in memory of Pasquino's brother who was killed when they were kids in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The family moved to Brockton in 1918. Now, Pierino was seven years older than Pasquino. But of several people said, hey, these two should meet. One, someone knew Pasqualina, someone knew Pierre Reno. I said, these two, we, we have to get these two together. So a house party was planned. The two were at the party. So the story goes, they looked, each, looked at each other, they locked eyes, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now that's, that's how Rocky's sister Betty, Betty Colombo explained it to me. They married in 1920. They had six children, three boys, three girls. Now the family initially lived on Brook Street, right, and they almost at the corner of Brook and Winthrop Street, a stone throw literally from Edgar's playground. Several years after Rocky was born, they moved several hundred feet that way to a house on Dover Street, which again was actually closer than the Brook Street house to James Edgar Playground. Now James Edgar Playground is where Rocky would spend most of his youth. And James Edgar Playground is where most of all the kids in this whole neighborhood would spend hours and hours playing baseball and football. That is where Rocky honed his skills to be a baseball player, to play football, and to get the stamina that was necessary from running back and forth, playing all these sports that would carry him through all of his fights in the future. When Rocky was born on September 1st, 1923, he was named after his paternal grandfather, Rocco. That was a custom observed by many ethnic groups. The son, the first son is named after the father's father, the first daughter is named after the mother's mother, etc., etc. That's the way they did it in my family as well. These are my uh, ancestors from Italy over here, my great grandparents and my grandparents. Now, I am 50% Italian, I am 25% English, and I am 25% Irish. This is my 50% Italian, that's my father right there, and this is my English and Irish. This is my grandpa, Fred Fuller. This is my grandmother, Nana Fuller. And that's my mother, Snooky Petty, right there. And there you have her parents. <laughs> Ali Colombo, Ali Colombo was a lifelong friend of Rocky's. He was a little bit older than Rocky, but Ali Colombo was always the organizer. He's the one who put things together. He's the one who got games going. He's the one who moved people around and got people introduced to other people. And what Ali Colombo knew, you know what Ali Colombo knew, Tony? He knew that there was something about Rocky Marciano. Rocky Marciano was a diamond in the rough. And Ali could see it. He knew that Rocky had that... <clears throat> Whatever was necessary within him to be a world champion boxer. Our final speaker today is none other than Mayor Bill Carpenter. Raised in a family of immigrants, the mayor had some interesting observations about the city from his perspective, not only as a citizen, but the leader of the city of champions. 
Mayor Coppiner, take it away. Welcome everybody. As the, the chairman of the library board, on behalf of my trustees, one of whom's in the back, Joe, um, our library director, Paul Engel, who's away at a conference, and all of our dedicated library staff, we would like to thank all of you who are here tonight supporting this wonderful series we are all Americans now, an American immigration dialogue series. That was, uh, got a grant and uh, we've done a whole bunch of um, these. They're, most of them have been on TV and we're looking forward to this one. We've covered a lot of issues and topics concerning immigration in our series. Tonight we are very fortunate to have our mayor, Bill Carpenter, give us a presentation on this topic. We thank him for honoring us with his presence tonight, and we hope you will find something this evening that is important to you or learn something new. So without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce Lucia Shannon, who will introduce the mayor. Welcome, Lucia. Thank you. And one, one interesting fact that I learned about the mayor uh, is that he has one ancestor, like me, from Sligo, okay? Now that's unusual. That's like being from Cape Verde and coming from the Isle of Sol. As mayor of the city of Brockton, Bill Carpenter has made substantial revitalization efforts that are attracting new investment and increased economic opportunity for both businesses and residents throughout the city. He is continuing to improve the city's departmental operations and its delivery of services by investing in technology and utilizing more contemporary methods to increase efficiency in our local government. And this is important. When you go to the website and you want to learn something, you actually can find the information. And I know because I'm a reference librarian for many, many decades. He's been feet on the ground ever since. He co-founded the Independence Academy, the state's fourth recovery school, and the only, only one in the four, and only the 43rd in the United States serving teenagers who are re-engaging their education while receiving treatment supports for substance abuse disorders. During his second term, he created the Champion Plan, an addiction outreach pro program meant to help those with substance use disorders in addiction treatment facilities. His unwavering commitment to public safety and community policing has begun to encourage companies to invest and reoccupy distressed business districts by improving the security of neighborhoods and corridors. It's really a pleasure to spend some time with you here this evening at the library. Melise, thank you so much for including me in this series. And uh, I think this series has been fantastic. And it's a, what this library really represents and all about. And you're doing a great job in community outreach and involving everyone in the city in our library. So thank you very much for including me. I thought I would tell you a little bit about my own family's background because um, folks sometimes wonder how I ended up being the mayor of Brockton. Uh, I get up some mornings and wonder the same thing myself. Uh, but, you know, I don't think I'm probably a typical mayor and probably not the typical background. So I thought if we're going to talk a little bit about immigration tonight, I'd tell you a little bit about my family and, and the family that I grew up in. I'll share something with you that I probably haven't told 20 people. I'm gonna tell you my middle name. Now, most people do not know my middle name, but it actually impacts this conversation. Um, and we'll try to keep the laughter down. Uh, my middle name is Gaither, G-A-I-T-H-E-R. You've probably never known anyone with the middle name Gaither before. Not something I bring up often, however, it relates to, it was a last name in my father's family in Maryland. And there is actually a Gaithersburg, Maryland, where that family is centered from. And they're connected with the same German immigrants that came to Maryland and came to Pennsylvania. And I believe that Gaither was actually the original one that everyone knew about, was a general in the Civil War for the other side. So, um, you know, we all come from very diverse backgrounds, and I don't have any family there, never knew any family there. My father, my father's father worked on the railroads uh, in, back in the 1930s, and uh, he was actually only eight years old when his dad died, and he, his mother came to Boston, and 
Uh, he was raised uh, by a single mother, uh, very poor. There wasn't a whole lot of public assistance back in the 1930s. And, uh, you know, he, he, um, he was raised, as uh, I said, by a single mom in the 30s and early 40s and grew up in the Depression and served in World War II. Today, I think people would describe Brockton as a multi-ethnic city. I think that in 10 or 20 years, people will describe Brockton as a city of multi-ethnic people because the communities do come together with time. In my own family, I have grandchildren that are half Cape Verdean. What they look like is what the future of America will look like because everybody is welcome here because we are so diverse and there are different languages spoken and there are different cultures. And part of what brings us together is the public library and the public school system. It's the public school system that provides the level playing field so that every child in the city, we really are a city of opportunity, but it's opportunity for all. And I can also tell you that we have never detained anybody or refused to post bail for anybody based upon their immigration status because it's not the role of local cities and local law enforcement to enforce civil immigration laws on the federal level that are broken. It says, in the absence of federal immigration reform, mayors in their cities continue to seek strategies to protect the safety of all of their residents while ensuring that local law enforcement is focused on community policing. In partnership with our police chiefs, we have strong reservations about any efforts, either through executive action or legislation, to deny federal funds to cities that aim to build trusting and supporting relations with immigrant communities. We believe that the dignity, health, rights, and privacy of all of our residents must be respected, and our cities must ensure that members of our immigrant communities are afforded an opportunity to thrive. And it goes on to give some specific policy recommendations that we've made. Um, and we agree that local law enforcement has to work with federal law enforcement agencies to keep the city safe. We agree that borders need to be secure. We agree that we need to improve um, the um, method of employment verification. I mean, these are legitimate issues that have to be addressed. But we also believe in a framework that enables people of goodwill currently living in the shadows to come out and fully pursue the American dream. And we believe in that too. The one other hand, I'm only going to give you two handouts, but I thought this other one was a policy statement that I issued on behalf of the city in January of 17. So this is over a year ago. But I thought it was important that the city have a position on race and equity. And so this, uh, this following statement of policy for the city of Brockton says that we believe in and stand for values of inclusion, equity, and justice that we welcome all people and recognize the rights of individuals to live their lives with dignity, free of discrimination because of their faith, race, national origin, immigration status, or sexual orientation. We will continue our work in making our services and programs accessible and open to all individuals, and we believe in the public sector for the public good. Advancing equity and inclusion is critical to the success of our city and our nation. Well, there you have it, Brockton. The immigration series is in the books. At least for this year, let's hope that Brockton Public Library can continue it. We hope you enjoyed the show. To learn more about Brockton Community Access, please visit our website at bcatv.org. You can also check out our YouTube page, youtube.com backslash the Brockton channels, all one word. For executive producer Mark Lindy and producer Aaron Tebow, I'm Jay Miller. We'll see you at the library.